Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everybody. So, yeah, I'm Ryan Lynch. I'm uh, certainly not a uh, medical doctor or any type of expert in healthcare. But uh, what I do have a background in is uh, <coughs> non human, uh, non animal uh, genomics, genetics, and biodiversity assays. And so, as we've heard throughout all the uh, amazing talks today, um, it's clear that there's the need to uh, really understand the source of all these different uh, therapeutic compounds and combinations of different compounds that seem to be uh, so compelling. So I don't have any type of uh, strong personal story that got, that got me involved with this. It was uh, more of an opportunity uh, scientifically and just sort of a, a general curiosity. and. Um, an identification of, of just a, a clear lack of, of study of the system. And so what I've observed, and I think what we've all seen, anybody that's, that's worked with the plants, is that there's this uh, tremendous phenotypic diversity. And whether that's the, you know, the branching structure, the leaf morphology, uh, the smell, the bouquet, the aroma that comes through from the terpenoid compounds, you know, the perceived effects when you consume it, or the therapeutic outcomes that were hopefully going to be able to nail down with some more uh, uh, carefully controlled uh, clinical trials. Um, there's clearly a lot of different uh, types uh, or varieties of cannabis out there. And so, <clears throat> given my background, I, yeah, I decided that uh, DNA sequencing and uh, analysis would be uh, one of the best ways to approach some of these questions. So, uh, a little outline of, I think, some of the, the best applications um, for uh, cannabis DNA analysis. Uh, I, I like to think of it as, uh, you know, there are ways to look into uh, the past, you know, the history of the plants. It's uh, at least 6,000 years uh, of domestication and, and transport around the planet. Um, there's certainly a lot of debate about uh, you know, the different uh, species name systems, nomenclatures, uh, varieties. Um, you know, there's also the operational uh, functional names that uh, people associate with the, the indica and the sativa uh, words, although those date back to the 1700s from Linnaeus and Lamarck. Uh, but I, th I think for me the most interesting thing, and, and it was uh, really highlighted listening to all the, the wonderful talks today, was uh, more the, the functional side of it. I think the, we can debate the taxonomy and what you should call what uh, endlessly, and it probably won't be uh, resolved anytime soon. Uh, in my opinion, there's probably, you know, we should be just calling it one species at this point, but it, it, it is an open question. But more importantly, uh, you know, we can leverage uh, different layers of information to start understand, uh, you know, some of the uh, underlying causes of these different uh, chemo pro profiles that uh, Mark just uh, uh, very carefully described. So that's going to that's gonna take a lot of uh, academic discourse and modeling and so forth. In the uh, more immediate uh, present, we can go through and just clean up uh, some of the issues that we have with uh, the names that you're seeing in the, the, the various state markets. And that's important because uh, patients and um, consumers, you know, they, they, they have expectations and they, uh, they associate different effects with these different names. And so that's something that uh, we, we can immediately start to um, draw lines in the sand and uh, begin to um, set some standards. And as a side effect of that, you can also uh, start um, uh, helping to establish uh, proof of ownership at a certain point in time through the sequencing data. So the other thing I'll touch on at the end, I won't really have time to go on this, but uh, going big, scaling up, developing new strains, automation, um, full agricultural genomics combined with uh, modern breeding techniques. So an important caveat, I think that uh, it's important, I have to remind myself this sometimes, is, uh, you know, the DNA is, is the code of life. It's, it's the instruction manual. The issue right now, and it's incredible, uh, the technological uh, revolutions that uh, 
have led us to be able to now, you know, access every letter in that instruction manual many times over for, you know, hundreds or just thousands of dollars uh, for human and, and, and plant, plant genomes. And so in the case of the cannabis genome, that's uh, 800 million or a little bit more uh, base pairs. So you have all that information, but we're still, we're still at the, at the uh, you know, this isn't Jurassic Park or anything. So it's not like, uh, it's important to keep in mind that we're not going to be able to take that digitalized information and go in and, and, and recreate some type of unique strain. And in some cases, we don't even know, you know, we can't even interpret what it would become. So there's, there's uh, it's still really a, a developing field in that sense, and it's uh, important to keep that in mind. So to address some of those questions, it's, uh, it's been an interesting process. You know, I started at the University of Colorado, and, uh, you know, just towards the end of last year, um, you know, transitioned into uh, the medicinal genomics, and it's, it's, uh, this, this issue has continued. Get, getting samples out of different grows has always been a unique challenge. It's uh, not something where we can just pick up a flower sample at your local dispensary and then take it onto campus uh, legally. So. Um, it's been some, some interesting stories there, driving around with a trunk full of centrifuges and pipette tips and um, training, training people that have been uh, growing their whole lives to do these DNA extractions and then um, dealing with uh, barcoding and uh, sample labeling issues. So it's, uh, it, it hasn't been easy, but um, you know, this is just a, a, a small array of just one grow, um, a medical uh, dispensary in Colorado. And, some of the, the interesting uh, shapes and leaflet blade morphologies and colors that, that, uh, that they had in stock at the time. So just a really quick overview on uh, the, the sequencing technology. I found this uh, the other night. It's a nice white paper by Florigenic. So if you're interested in the details, I think this is a, a really nice schematic. And so <clears throat> what it does is it, uh, it represents the genome as that, uh, that dark blue line at the top. And then uh, it, uh, it goes through all the different uh, steps that it takes to do the sequencing. And so uh, I, th I think the best to just look, look at the bottom down there and compare versus whole genome shotgun sequencing, which is what uh, I started out doing. It, it, uh, it fragments the, the original genome uh, into random little segments. And then you sequence all that. And then you realign it back to a reference. And so as you can see, uh, that, cr that, that does cover the entire genome, but it takes more, uh, more sequencing runs to uh, get that information compared to the RADSeq restriction site associated techniques that we're using now. So if you counted the stacks, the number of sequences in, in the RAD stacks, it would be fewer than the shotgun sequencing. And so the important point there is that it's, uh, these techniques have allowed us to uh, sequence more samples and gain enough information to do the analyses we're interested in uh, while keeping costs down. So to answer some of the relatedness uh, questions that uh, I, I find really interesting and I, I think have some direct applications to uh, most people involved in the in industry, I've, I've relied on a, a series of different uh, uh, methods to infer relatedness. and. Um, Behind, you know, there's a number of different models and, and algorithms and so forth, but I just wanted to point out some of the, the, uh, the nomenclature that we use to uh, interpret the visualizations. And so the obvious ones are the taxon, those are the, the samples, the strain or the variety. And then there's the, uh, the branch, which is really important. And so if you wanted to compare the relatedness between, for example, species D and E, you would add up those... Uh, those branch lengths on the x-axis. And what's important to keep in mind and is a little bit misleading about these renderings is that the distance on the y-axis isn't actually included in that calculation. So the other point is rooted versus unrooted. That's just a way of adding an extra orientation to the order in which you think different taxa have diverged. And so with cannabis, we don't have, uh, well, we know that the nearest uh, plant relative is hops, humulus, but we don't have the molecular um, reference tools to really use that. So all the, uh, the phylogenetic trees I'll, sh I'll show are, are unro unrooted. So the other thing to keep in mind, I pulled this off of uh, uh, icmag.com a few days ago, is that uh, you know cannabis, I mean, it has a very convoluted history. I mean, people have been doing this in their basement for decades in terms of uh, um, 
prohibition era breeding and you know moving these things around the world in very small batches and then there's the issue of course on the production side where uh, you really typically do not want a lot of pollen in your facility so we've had a bottleneck in terms of uh, male genetics and so um, this schematic that was just put together through uh, somebody's uh, recollection so I don't know how accurate that might be but you know it, it really looks more like a web than a bifurcating tree And so a compromise we came up with was uh, a tool that allow, it's sort of a hybrid that allows uh, inference of both network-like structure of relatedness and uh, tree structure. And so this is from a paper that uh, I did with uh, Nolan and the rest of the, the Kane lab. And uh, finally got it out into review, so it was uh, quite a battle with, with the editors. And uh, the point here, there are, uh, of course, sample names on all those. I think it's about, uh, it's just under 200 samples, and uh, there's a full 4 MB high resolution version if you want to check it out on the, the preprint server. But after a number of different uh, clustering and structural analysis models, uh, we were able to recover significant evidence for uh, three broad types of cannabis diversity. And we borrowed nomenclature from Rob Clark and Mark Merlin. And so we called those the broad leaflet drug type. And if you were to zoom in on those, you'd be able to see a lot of names that have Kush in them, and actually some samples that we have uh, pretty good confidence were actually um, brought over from Afghanistan. So these are shorter, stockier um, biotypes that uh, we believe originate from the north side of the Hindu Kush mountains. So then you have that big spray kind of from 11 o'clock all the way down to, uh, you know, about five o'clock there, and that's that's just a whole mess of other different varieties that uh, we're lumping in as the narrow leaflet drug types. And then uh, the most distinct one, of course, are the European hemp groups. That um, those are seed and oil uh, fiber types that uh, do not typically get used in uh, drug type breeding. So. If you're interested in any of the names in there, I mean, some of them are actually, you know, we've been able to recover clones from different states that are totally identical, but some of these are uh, not so consistent, and I'll go into some more examples with uh, more recent data we've done at uh, Medicinal Genomics, but I thought that was a good example, an old famous name, Jack Herrera. I mean, it's just, it's just all over the place, and uh, maybe there's a little cluster, almost a, uh, a, a hope for some type of consensus down there at six o'clock, but uh, it's certainly uh, it's certainly uh, not the same thing, and in, in from every source. So we don't have uh, any of the the resolution that uh, Mark just showed, but we were able to, uh, in a way, confirm some of the validity behind those genetic groups through looking at uh, average uh, cannabinoid and terpene levels and. Um, between those those three groups that we recovered, we found some significant differences that are uh, noted with the brackets and the different levels of significance in the asterisks. And so maybe not not uh, not huge magnitude of differences in the THC and the CBD, but um, you do find some very interesting uh, hints that uh, different genetic backgrounds may correlate to uh, some of these different terpenoid compounds. The, the linalool and the, the mercy in particular. So now at medicinal, I mean, we've we you know we're really looking to ramp this up and go from dozens or hundreds of samples to thousands, and um, go from just you know what we could scrape together in Colorado and maybe stuff people wanted to send us in California to uh, you know the the all all the states where there's access and of course uh, beyond. And so <laughs> this is uh, really just at the onset of, of our launch for this, but um, we've been able to, uh, to already make some great progress, and we're doing a, a rollout in Colorado and California with this. And we've really uh, upgraded our, our version of the RADSeq protocol, so we're getting a, a, a very large chunk of data from the genome. It's, uh, it's actually 10 times more than I used in, in, in my paper. And so that, that's going to be a, a great, robust platform that can be uh, developed into a number of, of different types of analysis down the road. And so I have a, um, actually, as of this Wednesday, uh, in the, uh, the Colorado State Tracking System, there's going to be over 100,000 uh, products that came from plants that we certified and tracked through 
uh, all the way from uh, clone or seed to uh, to harvest and, and and product, whether that's flower or MIPS. And so that's uh, something like I have some other updates here. Just came through 700 pounds of flour, and that's uh, just 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 at 41 strains. So we have the capacity to do. Um, hundreds if not, if not thousands of samples per week at the, the quarter gym medicinal genomics facility. So um, I'm, I'm really uh, excited to see what kind of uh, new patterns and stories emerge from that. So something Kevin touched upon, uh, I think it was last night at dinner. So it was, uh, <clears throat> you know, trying to tap into to just this global community. And uh, so we've set up a, a website where we're going to have different layers of uh, information from uh, our genetic sequencing efforts and also uh, our partner labs that are going to provide chemical uh, analytics and then also uh, a more distributed open source section where we can get reviews and um, different types of uh, feedback and comments from everybody in the community. So that's what we'll be rolling out. Um, step by step through April and May. So just a little, uh, <coughs> a little, a uh, couple little um, stories from the uh, latest data. Hopefully this works. Uh, that resolution got downgraded. One thing that popped out to me was uh, we, we do have some good, some good chemical data from uh, SC Labs actually generated this for us and uh, what we can see is that, uh, you know, a lot of the strains that are coming through with uh, the higher elevated CBD to THC ratios are, are clearly um, quite, uh, quite closely related. And so it suggests that uh, there's certainly room for improvement in terms of introducing that trait with, uh, you know, some of the other varieties out there that have different terpenoid compounds or, you know, other traits of interest that might be useful whether it's disease resistance or yield. Another thing I thought was interesting were the, uh, the, this cluster of green samples. You can't see the names there, but they're, they're all different. And uh, the genetic distances to me suggest that we've picked up uh, a breeder who's been using one male for a variety of different females. And so, um, you know, it's not, uh, it's not like that makes those, those varieties useless or anything, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting and it shows uh, some of the limitations of the, the current uh, breeding techniques that have been used. Hopefully you guys can read that, yeah. So there's an example of just uh, total strain name inconsistency. So we have a, a Snoop's Dream sample that was picked up from a dispensary in Washington State and that was that ended up being genetically identical to another variety that came out of a Colorado medical dispensary called Blue Dream. So I don't know which one's which or uh, what was the original. We can't say that from those data point, but uh, I looked it up on Leafly. Snoop's Dream is supposed to be a hybrid between a Master Kush and a Blue Dream, but uh, so maybe it's the Blue Dream that's mislabeled here in this case, but. That's going to be the thing. As we get more and more samples, we'll be able to build case studies on, on some of these inconsistencies and uh, go back and, and, hopefully, uh, and hopefully clean up some of these issues. And there's just another little uh, cluster issue there. So we have, uh, we have canatonic butane, uh, butan and the catatonic ACDC variety. Those were all genetically identical three different names, they all came, uh, two were from California, one, were, one was from Massachusetts. So I'm not sure what the original was there either, but. Well, just, uh, I'll, I'll just leave you guys with this little, uh, you know, dream big here. So, th so this is something from Pioneer Genetics, and so what, what this machine is, is a corn chipper, and so they'll do crosses. This is a way to accelerate breeding, improve strains, novel, traits, intergressed, you can uh, do crosses, dump the seeds in somewhere at the top, it's kind of cut out of the picture, labels each one, uh, rotates it around, takes a little cutting off of the embryo, the seed's still viable, stores the seed, DNA sequencing off of that uh, little piece that was removed, search for markers, decide which ones you're actually gonna grow and do field trials on. All automated, 
you know, genomic selection, marker selection. So it's it's uh, obviously a work in progress, but uh, put that on the, uh, the the wish list for your next grow. <laughs> so just a quick summary there, and uh, probably over the timeline here. So I think uh, there's there's um, you know there's a lot of information that you can get out of DNA sequencing, and some of it isn't interpretable, but some of it you can't really get otherwise. So. It's important that uh, we consider these data, but it's also important that we don't uh, that we that we work together and we blend these data and we layer them. So the genetic data without the chemical data is uh, it's a little bit thin, and together they can make some really powerful tools. And so as we've uh, we've heard in some of these talks and some of the papers that have come out recently, there's this number changes, but I'm quoting uh, 113 different uh, phytocannabinoids have been identified and at least 120 uh, terpenoid compounds. And so the caveat there is, okay, yeah, it's found on the plant. The plant may not necessarily actually synthesize all those. As Kevin brought up, there's uh, certainly the potential for uh, some of the alterations in the chemical structures coming from the, the microbiome, but uh, it's intriguing nonetheless. And, uh, I think there's a, a lot of room for improvement. Thanks for listening.